Gosh. Um, I just joined the Prelude, but I wanted to um, dedicate this <laughs> to all those May and June wedding people, uh, especially to my parents, whose anniversary, wedding anniversary is today, May 2nd, and also Russ and Elaine Coon share the same anniversary date. So um, just a song kind of in honor of their day and, uh, you know, many anniversaries are coming up in May and June.
I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Please stand for the singing of our first hymn.
Thank you, that was beautiful. Would the kids like to come up with a children's message? saw the, uh, the church email or my email that went out to you earlier this week. We are going to be doing a study, a Bible study of Ecclesiastes starting on May the 12th, Wednesday. So if you haven't had a chance to sign up and you're interested, let me know. We are going to be doing this by Zoom, but we will be um, available to meet here in the ministry center in the parlor. If you can't do Zoom or if you'd rather meet in person, just let me know. So, um, just give me a, drop me an email or a phone call or whatever, and we'll, we'll call the office, and we'll put you on the list and order you a study guide if you want. They're about seven dollars or seven fifty. So appreciate that. Also, prayer 
uh, concern came in a little too late to be on the prayer list for a young man who has pancreatitis. So please keep him in prayer. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we are thankful that you never leave us or forsake us. No matter how many times we run from you or hide from you or ignore you or pretend we don't hear you speaking to us, you never give up on us. You pursue us to bring us back to you. We don't know why you do this, Lord. Heaven knows we don't do it in our own relationships. We are too quick to give up on people. We drop them dead if we have disagreements. We show no grace, even though you pour out your grace on us day by day. We refuse to forgive when you have forgiven us more than we'll ever know. And when Jesus told us specifically that if we want our Father in heaven to forgive us, we also have to forgive others. So as you know, Lord, we're just a mess, in need of your grace and in need of your transformation. We need to have the mind of Christ in our dealings with each other and in our relationship with you. Jesus, you forgave even those who sent you to your death and nailed you to the cross. How can we do any less? Teach us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. And teach us to do the same for those who are closest to us. Because sometimes they feel like persecutors, if we're honest. And we feel like that to them as well. Bring healing to all in our church and community who are suffering and ill, to all who are grieving, to all who are struggling under the weight of this pandemic. Make us instruments of your peace and make us instruments of your grace. Show us how we can be channels of your love to everyone we know and everyone we need. Let our worship be the way in which we encounter your transformative love and begin to be changed into the image of Jesus Christ, the risen one, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is from Psalms 22, 25 to 31. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, prosperity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. This is the word of the Lord.
our second family we have this week are the cutoffs. And sorry to tell you this, but the cutoffs had a Zoom meeting last night, got into an argument, and cut each other off. So I am going to play the cutoffs based on my family, which has also been known to do this. So this week we polled 100 Faith Factory students. Oh. And families. Oh. And the question was, things you say when someone in your family annoys you. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go first to the distancer family. The question is, things you say when someone in your family annoys you. I'm not listening. And that's your answer? Yeah. All right, on the board, do we have, I'm not listening. There we go. All right, distancer family. Again, the question is, things you say when someone in your family annoys you. Oh, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, let me think here. Uh, oh, I know. I'm going to take a walk. I'm going to take a walk. Is that on the board? It is on the board. Distancers, you guys are doing good. All right, again, the question is, things you say when someone in your family annoys you. I'm going to my room. I'm going to my room. Who has never heard that? Is that on the board? It is on the board. All right, distancers, this might be a clean sweep. All right, again, things you say when someone in your family annoys you. It's time for a vacation. Time for a vacation. That's a good one. All right, is that on the board? Number one answer. Time for a vacation. All right, distancers, there's four answers left. Things you say when someone in your family annoys you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, do you want to talk about the problem? <laughs> oh. Sure that's your answer? Yeah. I don't know. Do you want to talk about the problem? Is that on the board? <clears throat> I am sorry, distancers, but we'll see how the cutoffs do. <laughs> but I gotta tell you a little bit about my Aunt Linda. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Bet you guys never saw me with her. <laughs> so when I would get in an argument with my Aunt Linda, the first thing she'd say is, I'm out of here. How many of us have heard that before? Let's see if that's on the board. I'm out of here. <laughs> All right, Aunt Linda's great. Oh. And those of you who are in a family with multiple daughters, you all know each of the daughters have a different personality. And then, of course, there's always that middle daughter. And everyone knows the middle daughter. Well, the middle daughter, Monica, always says, never speak to me again. I know we've heard that before. So let's see if that's on the board. All right. And those sibling rivalries, let me tell you. Anyone who has a brother or a sister, sometimes they're a little bit different than you are. Sometimes they're adopted from New Jersey. <laughs> Like Brother Jerome, and Brother Jerome's pretty tight, he goes, you're dead to me. How many of you heard that before? Let's see if that's on the board. Oh, it is. And of course, anyone who's married, you know the relationship of a husband and wife is always so sacred. So you know, things you say when your family annoys you and your wife always just goes, who? 
and acts like you're not there. So let's see if who is on the board. It is! So the cutoffs will win this one. But really, does anyone win this week with this kind of family? All right, we'll see you guys next week.
or physical space, they, they literally move away from the rest of the family. And this is because family systems theory says there are two equal and opposite forces in our relationships. There's togetherness. We want intimacy. We want to be close to other people. But at the same time, there is a force for separateness. We want our independence. And if there is conflict in the family, and if there's too much togetherness, it feels like too much togetherness because of the conflict, we respond by wanting to be separate. And so we pull away and we become distant. Now, the distance can, sometimes it just remains distant, but other times it goes to the next level of, what we, of actual cutoff. People actually cut themselves off from the family. And uh, sometimes it takes the form of what, what's now known as ghosting, where someone that simply disappears from the family or the relationship. Or it can be a very dramatic kind of thing where someone says, you're dead to me, I'm out of here. Or it can be something like divorce, which is a legal end to the relationship. In any event, cutoff and distancing are forms of loss, like death. And because this is a kind of loss like death, it creates incredible stress on the people who have left in whatever way and on the people who will remain in the family system. And so they re it, re uh, it tends to create a lot of potential for emotional illness, like depression, and the risk of physical illness. This happens a lot because of uh, distance and cutoff. Now here's the thing. People who have distanced themselves or cut off their relationship think that they've solved their problem by simply removing themselves from a conflicted family situation. But actually, they are just as enmeshed in the conflicted family relationship as the person who is still in that family relationship and is, and is having a big fight with everybody else. It doesn't solve the problem. It just papers it over. And so you can see why the risk of emotional and physical illness is just as high for the person who is cut off and distant as it is for the folks who are still in a conflicted family relationship. We have, in this country, an epidemic of cutoff in our families. And this was before we became so politically polarized. I think about 10 years ago, there was an estimate by experts that one in 25 parents in this country is estranged from an adult child. No matter who was responsible for the cutoff, or the estrangement, whether it was the parent or the child. Since the 2016 election, that pattern has intensified. And now there was a study saying that if a family has very highly partisan people in the family, you're more likely to have estrangement over politics. Which means, just to go off topic a little bit, we are choosing to put our allegiance with politicians and pundits who don't know us, who don't really care about us as individuals. I'm speaking as someone who used to cover politics for a living. I can, I can tell you this with a, fair, a high degree of confidence. They don't know you as individuals. They don't care about you as individuals. And we're putting our allegiance with ideologies, with Facebook groups, instead of with the people who know us best and who are the ones who are going to be there for us when something goes wrong. It just doesn't make any sense. But that's what's happening. And it's tearing us apart as families, not even to address the whole national problem. So what about church? 
Because remember, everything we say about families at home also applies to our church families. In church, the problem is that we have not been taught how to deal with conflict on a healthy basis. And so whenever people have a disagreement, usually the first thing that happens is we begin to distance from each other. You know how, how that goes. We sort of pretend the other person doesn't exist. And you do one of these, right? And you walk in the other direction. And you see someone, the other person coming. And then at the far end, at the extreme end, you have cut off, someone leaves the church. And what, happen, what happens with that? That's a death in the family, isn't it? And it feels like a death in the family. It leaves unhealed wounds in the body of Christ. This is not a healthy situation for the church either. So let's talk a little bit about the problem of cutoff and distancing as it is, uh, exa some examples in scripture. And I'm gonna give you two examples. One of them is not a real happy ending, and the other one is a better ending. <laughs> Just to show you that there is hope. You think we could get that mic stand up on the other side of the fence just so I don't, so I'm not doing like this. Thanks so much. So the first is from Genesis chapter 21. You remember that uh, a couple weeks ago we read the story of Abraham and uh, Sarah and their triangle relationship with Hagar. And uh, that mm, sort of ended okay, not great, but now we're going to jump ahead 14 years roughly. Uh, and we're going to pick up at Genesis 21. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the very time God had promised him, Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old, when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, <laughs> and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. Personally, I'm like, Sarah, girl, man, God bless you. She's 90 years old. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children, yet I have born him a son in his old age? The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking, and she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. So Ishmael, by the time Isaac is weaned, uh, which is, would have been about age two, roughly, Ishmael is about 16. Now, he has been Abraham's heir to this point, until Isaac is born. Can you imagine how he feels when this promised child is born? He's been disinherited. We don't know what he was making fun of. And maybe Sarah saw something that day at the at party that made her concern for Isaac's safety. But in any event, she wants to cut off the relationship. She wants Hagar and Ishmael gone immediately. And Abraham is upset about it because this is also his son, as you might imagine. So back to verse 12. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes.
dishes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God preserved both of their lives. And Ishmael, as far as we know, the tradition says Ishmael was the father of some of the Arab tribes. But Ishmael and Hagar remained cut off from the family, although according to Genesis 25, Ishmael does return to help bury Abraham when Abraham dies. If we do accept that tradition that Ishmael is the father of some of the Arab people, we can see the consequences of family cutoff generation to generation. How much conflict has there been between the descendants of Isaac and the descendants of Ishmael? Generations and generations and generations. So that's kind of discouraging. So let's turn to a slightly less, to a more uh, upbeat or a better ending. In Acts chapter 15, we're going to be picking up at verse 36. And this is the story of Paul and Barnabas. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him, because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left. Commanded by the believers to the grace of the Lord, he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Paul and Barnabas were the dynamic duo of the early church. They were the ones who were sent, commissioned by the Holy Spirit, sent out from the church in Antioch, went on his first missionary journey, preached the word of the Lord, planted churches all over Asia Minor, and they had just won a great victory at the Jerusalem Council, and then as they were going to go back and return and visit the churches they had planted, they had this disagreement over whether they should take John Mark along and John Mark apparently had disappeared. He ghosted them <laughs> in Pamphylia. Barnabas, whose name, whose nickname means son of encouragement, wants to take him, wants to take him back, and Paul says, nope, no way. This seems like a really trivial reason to break up the partnership. It really does. But this is what happens. This is our, the reasons we have these disagreements in our families and in churches are usually not really good reasons to fight over, are they? Think back to your, in your own family situations. Usually our big disagreements are relatively minor things that got out of hand. So how did the story end? Well, let's just take a look at Colossians chapter 4. And here's verse 10. And this is the letter that Paul wrote after the events of the book of Acts, there in Acts 15. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. So Mark is with Paul at this point. And then if you flip back to 2 Timothy chapter 4, near the end of Paul's life, in verse 11, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. So Paul and Mark resolve their differences somewhere along the line. And I'm going to assume that, Bar that Paul and Barnabas also resolve their differences. Why is, the story, why is this story different from the story in Genesis? Let me suggest that Jesus makes all the difference in that relationship. So, 
when our family relationships are cut off in distance, what do we do to close the distance? Distance and cut off have been in the world since the fall in Genesis 3. We actually cut off our relationship with God in the fall. And ever since then, we've been distancing and cutting off from other people. But consider the pattern that God sets for us. God is the one who came after us. God took the initiative to pursue us, to close the distance with us, even though it was our fault that we are cut off from God. He came after us. Jesus went to the cross to close the distance between us and God. And because of that, we need to think about that pattern when we think about what we should be doing in our distant and cut off family relationships. We have to take the first move. We have to take the initiative. Whether we are responsible for the distance and the cutoff or not, the responsibility first starts with us. Because as family system theory tells us over and over, we can't change anybody else. We can only change ourselves. So the first thing we need to do is consider what is my part in the conflict that produced the distance and the cutoff? What's my problem? What, what was my role in this? Because I've, you know, in 13 years of doing pastoral counseling, I don't think I've ever come across a situation where it was 100% one person's fault. I'm sure there are situations like that, but usually there's a little bit of a responsibility on someone's side, you know, even if most of it's on the other person's side, generally. How much of this is my responsibility? And then we need to reach out to the other person or persons with forgiveness and reconciliation as God and through Jesus did for us. So if you have distanced yourself from someone or cut someone off, consider what your responsibility is and then make an approach. Until you are able, until you can establish a relationship with the people you distance from or cut off from, you will not be able to move forward in life. You will continue to be stuck. I'm speaking from experience here. You know, I'm not telling you something I haven't already gone through myself. I would recommend that you make an, your first approach in writing, email, text, a letter, a note, because you don't want to ambush people with a phone call, give them an opportunity to think about what, you just, what you're saying. If, you're, if it's part of your fault, you need to apologize for what your responsibility was, your part in the conflict. Offer a relationship it probably won't be a really great relationship to start, but take whatever you can get and whatever you can give. Ideally, it would be good to be able to talk about the problem that produced the distance and the cutoff, but if you can't, even if you can talk about the weather, that's okay. Any kind of a casual conversation is a start. Start there and then see what develops from there. There are some caveats and some exceptions. There are some people who probably you will not be able to rebuild any kind of a relationship with. If there was an abuse situation, that's probably not gonna work. If, and there are some people who are so toxic, you're probably not gonna be able to do that. You will need to work on a process of forgiveness, but that is different from reconciliation. Talk to me sometime about that. I'd be happy to <laughs> discuss the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. If you have been cut off or distanced from by someone, you still have to make the first move. And again, writing something in writing is probably better. And let them know the door is always open for them to come back home. The door, the door is always open invite them back. But don't push. Because the more 
you pursue a distancer or someone who was cut off, the faster they'll run in the other direction. But keep the door open and then pray and pray and pray. We have friends who, whose adult daughter had cut them off for decades. And about 10 years ago, she reestablished contact out of the blue. Prayer works. Doesn't, all, doesn't work in every situation. And I can't explain it. But in this case, she came back. What about in church? We need to learn how to manage and deal with our conflicts in a, a healthy, Jesus-honoring way. So our leadership team has just adopted a conflict resolution policy. And we will be teaching that and talking about it as we go forward. But just to let you know, we do have a tool to help us with this. But the first thing we need to do is overcome our instinct. And we do have an instinct to run in the opposite direction whenever we have a conflict with someone. We need to push ourselves to close distance with someone we've disagreed with to be able to go to them and say, can we talk about this? Because, you see, God does not intend his body, the church, to be divided against itself. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. We all need each other. We need to try to resolve our problems before we get to the point of cutoff in the church. A long time ago, a novelist named Thomas Wolfe wrote a book called You Can't Go Home Again. Let me argue that he's wrong. With Jesus, we can go home again. And indeed, if we are ever going to overcome the problems and the distance and the cutoff, and if we are going to be able to move forward in our lives, we need to learn how to go home again. How to overcome the distance and the cutoff and resume a relationship of some kind with the people we've had conflict with in the past. And this is going to involve asking Jesus come into our hearts, to show us how to overcome our problems, to show us how to admit our fault, to soften the hearts of peoples, the other people in the conflicts that are willing to come forward to and, and meet us part way, to help us humble ourselves. This is hard stuff. But Jesus can do it. With his help, we can go home again. And indeed, we must. Let's pray. Lord, you intend us to live in harmony with each other. You intend us to resolve conflicts. You intend us to solve our problems together. And we don't always know how to do this, but you can show us. So Lord, help us to rebuild our broken family relationships so that in all things, you are honored and glorified and praised. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let us close today with the sacrament of Holy Communion. If you did not get a communion cup on your way in, if you could just raise your hand so we could get one to you. Communion liturgy is in your bulletin. I just have to stop myself because I always want to say it's, in, it's on the screen too. Okay. No, it's not. Lift up your heads. 
Lift up your hearts. We lift up the Lord. Lift up your hands. We dedicate our hands to the hearts and our hands to the worship of God. We offer our entire being to the God of creation, who made the sun and the moon and hung the stars in the sky. Blessed be the name of the Lord who created us and fashioned us from the dust and breathed into us the breath of life. We praise you with your people on earth and all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He healed the sick, raised the dead, and cast out demons. But we turned him into a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Jesus was persecuted by religious leaders and betrayed by one of his own. He was tortured and nailed to a cross to die. Yet while hanging on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We give you thanks that nothing that ever was or ever will be will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Early on the morning of the third day, Jesus laughed at death and walked among us alive. Forty days later, he ascended into heaven, where he is seated at the right hand of God. Our eyes are turned to the skies, looking for the day when Jesus shall return to a kingdom without end, where sickness and disease are not known, where evil will cease from troubling, and we will study war no more. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he shared a meal with his disciples. He took bread, gave thanks to God, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the meal was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Pour it out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Today, Jesus, we remember the bread and the cup. Today, we remember your life and your death. We remember your resurrection. We remember eternal life. And we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has come among us. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ abides with us. Christ will come again. Holy God, pour out your spirit upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. Pour out your spirit upon us as we offer ourselves to be God's presence in the world until Jesus returns in glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. You would take your communion kits and peel back that first little piece of cellophane for the wafer. This is the body of the one who has sacrificed himself for us to give us eternal life. Let us eat together with joy. Peel back that second piece of foil for the juice. This is the blood of him who returns for us at the end of time. Let us bring it together with thanksgiving. together the prayer after communion. Lord, you now have set your servants free to go in peace as you have promised. 
For these eyes of ours have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see. Blessed and honor and glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Would you stand and worship with me? Thank you. 
Receive the blessing of the Lord. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Brothers and sisters, go in peace to serve the Lord and to restore broken relationships. Amen.